Uh, I'll start. So um, today we're going to talk about uh, convolutional networks for text. Um, and there was a reading, but because I think uh, you know summarizing and going through uh, is a good way to get any questions out of the way, the first part will be a brief summary, then I'll talk about some more uh, advanced topics. So um, the, as I've been doing before, I'm going to talk about sentence classification as an example problem where we have, I hate this movie, I love this movie, uh, and we want to classify them into you know, very bad and very good, et cetera. Um, and at the beginning of this class, the first thing that we tried to do was a bag of words. So basically, here we look up a score for each of the words, good, medium, bad, uh, or sorry, very good, good, uh, neutral, me bad, very bad. Um, and so we have a vector of size 5 for each of these. Over here, uh, we add up our bias and we get our scores. Um, so this was the first example. I think this should be nothing new. Um, and we tried to break this um, by basically coming up with things where we had some sort of negation or we had some sort of thing where, you know, basically we can't pick it up just because by looking at the words. Um, and uh, so the continuous bag of words actually would still be broken by a lot of these examples, but the continuous bag of words basically we calculated features for each of the um, for each of the words. Then we used these features, multiplied it by a matrix, added a bias, and got our scores. Um, and then this solves one problem of the bag of words model. It makes us able to share information among similar words, but it doesn't solve any of the problems with having don't like or uh, not great or something like that. So then the second attempt we made at the beginning of the class was deep SIBO. So deep SIBO, uh, basically we do the same thing. We add up everything like this. Um, we, but instead of just taking this as is, we, um, we basically run it through a couple neural network layers to get this, uh, multiply the weight matrix, bias, scores, et cetera. So, now, this is something that I talked about a long time ago, so people might have uh, forgotten about this. But now if we think about it, what do our features represent? Uh, what do the vectors represent? So the input vectors, they represent uh, features of the words. So we look up uh, for each word a vector, and each one represents some sort of features of the words. Um, but after running them through a couple neural network layers, we can learn you know, feature combinations. We can learn stuff like, um, a node in the second layer might be equal to feature one and feature five are active. And specifically, this might be, we can capture things um, like not and hate up here in the same sentence. Um, so we can, we can capture feature combinations, but um, you know, still this is not quite sufficient because it cannot necessarily determine whether it's actually saying not hate. Uh, or don't hate, uh, not good, etc. So we could think of something um, like this is a beautiful movie. This is a beautiful movie um, that demonstrates how hate, not love, is uh, how hate, not love, is uh, powering the tobacco industry or something like that. I, I don't know. I just made up the sentence. It didn't appear anywhere. Uh, but it, it's not the fact that we have, because we have these two words in the sentence, they mean their kind of canonical way of saying things. So that maybe handling combinations uh, is not the correct word for this, but handling, uh, handling local uh, combinations with in consideration to ordering is probably a better way. And um, that's what we do, uh, what we aim to do with CNNs. Um, so bag of engrams is kind of our first attempt at a CNN. This is what we would do before we had CNNs for text classification or before we used CNNs for text classification. And basically what we do, would do is instead of taking the bag of words, um, Uh, we would look at individual words in the sentence and say I and hate and this and movie. And then we would also get um, I hate, 
hate this, this movie, I hate this, hate this movie, etc. So maybe if we went up to three, we would enumerate all of these. And then for each of these unigrams and bigrams and trigrams, we would calculate a feature vector for each of these, right? So this is um, something that you used to do. I, I don't know if you did something like this in your, a previous NLP class to do text classification. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. No. It has, who has done this in NLP to do text classification? In the class or? or just in general. Whoa, that's actually a surprisingly low number. I, uh, you know, this is a pretty this is a pretty common uh, method that you can uh, you can use for a lot of things. Seven four one. It was okay. Well, so hopefully I would see most people raise. Maybe it's just late in the day and people are uh, are tired or something. Okay, so bag of n-grams, this is a good baseline. Um, and then we add our bias. Uh, we sum all of these together and get our scores. And uh, we use this to calculate our probabilities. So the nice thing about this is um, it allows us to capture feature combinations in a simple way. So we can get stuff like don't love, not the best, uh, etc. Anything as long as it's up to length uh, three. And we've seen it in our training data enough times to learn the values. Um, it also works pretty well. So I don't know if people have seen this online. This was an interesting, uh, this was an interesting exchange by uh, a machine learning researcher, uh, Francois uh, Cholet, I guess. Um, I, maybe I got his name wrong. But he, he wrote Keras, and, uh, and he's uh, relatively famous for that. But they came up with this, uh, with this kind of nice task for, um, for theorem proving and said, can you beat our 83 accuracy baseline? And then um, within a couple hours, Hal Domey said, sure, I can do that. Uh, it took me about an hour, and I beat it with 85. And you can see his, the entirety of his code right here. And it's basically extracting bag of engrams features. Uh, so despite the fact that this, uh, this model, or, or for this particular task, uh, they had some pretty sophisticated models, bag of engrams is still a pretty strong baseline, I guess. Uh, you can look this up. This is not a this is not a lie. And Hal is going to be very mad at me uh, because he doesn't want to be Mr. Bag of Engrams uh, apparently. But uh, hey, okay. So anyway, Bag of Engrams is good, um, but it does have some problems. Um, so it has the same problem uh, as basically if you want to um, if you want to incorporate combination features uh, without using a neural network. So one way to incorporate combination features without using a neural network that I talked about before was basically to enumerate all combinations of features and you know, learn a separate feature for each of them. Um, that's one way to solve XOR. That's one way to solve most of your nonlinear non problems. But the problem is it just ex uh, explodes and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't scale. Uh, both memory-wise and training-wise. Okay, so, yeah. So when the aggregation is performed, it's performed over all the n-grams or n-grams of a particular length, and then you're aggregating the victims' length n-grams. Oh, so um, yeah. So actually, let me. Uh, just, if I go back, basically what we do is we calculate a feature vector for all n-grams of up to a certain length, um, and then we calculate the feature vectors for all of these n-grams, and we sum them together. So if we have things up to three grams in our vocabulary <coughs> sizes, V, for example, we would potentially have V to the three features, right? Um, because the, we have the first position, we have the second position, and we have the third position, and each of them could be any, anything in the vocabulary. In reality, we only calculate features for all of the words, uh, all of the engrams that are in our training corpus. So that's, that's significantly fewer than you know, v to the three, but it's still pretty big if you get a big training corpus. So. Would it be a better idea to sum over n grams of the same n, like uh, unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams uh, summed over separately, and then concatenating the equations <coughs> together, and then performing a soft plans over that? Um, sure, you can try it. <laughs> I, uh, it. There's a number of better a, a number of better ways to do things, and. Um, 
I believe one of the papers that I'm going to talk about is doing something kind of similar to that. And I can explain the parallels. But oh, sorry, if you couldn't hear the question, the question was, what if you calculated these vectors for each of these orders separately and then concatenated them together and did a softmax over that instead? Um, and I think one of the uh, later papers I'm going to talk about is doing something similar, although not as direct. Any other questions? Yeah. So the question was, can we use a dependency parse of a sentence to extract features um, over bigrams and trigrams and stuff? And yes, you can. I, I think it's a good idea. Um, it's, generally a good it's generally a good idea if you can extract things that make sense to you. So like if you want to do, in, in general, if you want to do something for NLP, um, one piece of advice that I give to people uh, is, Think about what you would do if you were writing a rule-based system and make sure your model can capture that without making too much, without doing too much work. Um, so the idea would be like if you wanted to write rules and those rules required a dependency tree, it might be a good idea to incorporate a dependency tree into your model in some way. Um, I'm actually also going to talk about that later. So uh, <laughs> I'll talk about how we can use dependency trees and stuff uh, in these models as well. Anything else? No? OK, I'll, I'll move on to the next one. So um, oh, I forgot. One, one important thing is that the other disadvantage of bag of n-grams is that there's no shearing between similar n-grams. So if you say, um, if you say something like, uh, I, I hate, I hate it, or don't hate it, and then don't despise it. If don't despise didn't appear in your training corpus for whatever reason, you wouldn't be able to use that, uh, that information and generalize. Uh, so there's no sharing between similar words and engrams unless you exactly match them. Um, and uh, that's something that we can improve with neural networks. So next I will explain um, about convolutional neural networks uh, and time delay networks. Uh, I'll, I'm sure you've probably at least heard the name of the second one, maybe not the first one. Um, so the, um, sorry, my animation broke there, but uh, Time delay neural networks basically are a neural network that looks like this. So a neural network, um, they were invented in 1989 by uh, Alex Weibel, who uh, is here in the KIT. Um, but basically the idea is we calculate a vector. Um, we calculate a, uh, a vector for each word. Then we step through the, uh, step through the sentence. And we concatenate the first two vectors and multiply them by a weight, add a bias, and take a tan h. Uh, then we do it for the second, uh, the second and third vectors, then we do it for the third and fourth vectors. And this gives us uh, some purple vectors down there that basically incorporate these things. And then we can do whatever we want with them, like combine them in some way and, uh, and do a softmax. Um, so these are, uh, the interesting thing here is these are like soft bigrams. So, so the reason why they're like soft bigrams is basically instead of taking a single word and doing something to it, we're taking two words, combining them together and like extracting features from them and, uh, and then uh, doing that. So this can capture things like don't hate or not good or something. So this is, uh, this is basically the soft version of bag of engrams that allows us to consider similarities between words, et cetera. So, um, what is that combined function? Um, I'll, I'll talk about it later, but it's, it's basically pooling, um, which you read about. It, it wasn't called pooling in time delay neural networks, which is why I'm, uh, why I'm not saying. So then, uh, convolutional neural networks are, um, are something that mainly were first kind of considered for images. 
And the way these work, uh, as was described in the, uh, in the book a little bit, but maybe not in the context of images, is basically you calculate some features from a patch of the image, and you move it over the, ver the horizontal uh, way. Uh, you move it horizontally and vertically. And these feature extractors then extract, say, five features uh, for 30, um, for, let's see, uh, for certain size patches. And then we do an, a sim similar thing. Uh, so the, the difference, the main difference between this and the previous one is the previous one was talking about a 1D sweep over sentences, while this one was, is talking about a 2D sweep over images. Um, so, um, so basically, uh, we, we talk about convolutional neural networks um, quite a bit. Convolutional neural networks are basically the arbitrary dimensioned version of time delay neural networks, if you think about it. So we should, if we're doing stuff for text, we should probably call them time delay neural networks. But if you do, then people will get confused. So uh, <laughs> we'll likely get confused. So call them what you like. But definitely at least cite the, uh, the original paper on this, I think, to give credit there. Um, OK. So are, are there any questions so far? I, because we're talking about text this time, I'm not going to talk about 2D uh, sweeps through things. Um, 2D sweeps through things are very, very important for images. They're less important for, uh, they're less important for text. They're somewhat important for, uh, or they're sometimes used in speech, but not very often. Um, because in speech, you have an ordering of the frequencies that you're looking at, and you can sweep over various orders of the frequencies. But for text, we almost always use uh, 1D convolution. So 1D convolution um, is basically a time delay neural network. Um, but because the people who, um, who have been using images have kind of been the people who mainly were in, in charge of developing convolutions, they often use terminology or uh, stuff from image processing. So you'll often see things like channels. So the channel is the RGB channel, uh, the red, green, blue channel. Um, in text, we should probably call them features instead. Um, you also see uh, um, you also see various other uh, terminology. But it, once you get used to it, it, it doesn't bother you so much, I think. Um, so then there's a couple other uh, paradigm uh, there's a couple paradigms in which you can use uh, neural networks for text. I think the two really main ones are basically to use them as, uh, as feature extractors for a particular context, and then use those feature extractors for a particular context to make a, a prediction, basically. And then the second one is uh, sentence modeling. So in this case, you do convolution to extract basically engrams, uh, features of engrams, and then you combine them together in a pool to make a prediction about a sentence. And I'll talk about both of them uh, in, uh, throughout the rest of the uh, talk here. Um, so both of these were basically, to my knowledge, proposed by Culibert and Weston in 2011. Uh, if you haven't read this paper, it's a pretty famous paper, so I think many people have read it. Uh, but it's natural language processing almost from scratch. Uh, they basically solved all of the problems in neural networks for NLP. Um, but they were two or three years too early, so nobody realized that they did this. Um, but they, this is actually a very good paper. They did a lot of, uh, they did a lot of work and made things actually work quite well. Um, and it really preceded the deep learning boom. So it's kind of an interesting paper to read. Um, so... This is the um, this is the CNNs for basically context window modeling. So the context window modeling is um, what they're doing here is they're trying to predict some sort of tags uh, for each individual word. And the way they do this, um, so in this case, let's say they want to predict a tag for the word on. The way they do this is they look at the words on either side. Um, so this actually looks a lot like the skip gram model for, uh, for, um, uh, for calculating word embeddings. So then they extract a, uh, 
they do a lookup over the words in all the other features. So they might have other features like part of speech tags or something like that. Uh, then they basically concatenate all of these together and do a linear transform. So this is the idea of the convolution or the time delay neural network where you concatenate all your features and do a linear transform. And then you have a nonlinearity. In their case, they used hard to H. You can use anything else that you want. And then you have a linear uh, function to do a prediction or something like that over tags. So this is a, a pretty nice model for part of speech tagging or whatever. They used it for a bunch of different tasks, I think. So then CNNs for sentence modeling, they look very similar. Uh, you basically, um, for each of the things here, you, uh, you look up things in the lookup table, you do convolution, uh, then you do a max over time. So this is the pooling operation that they talked about uh, in, the, in the reading materials. And then you do a linear transform, uh, hard 10 H linear transform. So this is, uh, the, the, diff the main difference here is that you're doing, the, uh, you're doing it over all the words in the sentence and then do, doing pooling afterwards to make a prediction. So this is what you would use if you want to do sentiment analysis or any other prediction over, over sentences, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's almost exactly the same. The structure is different, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the so are there any questions so far? Any other questions? No. Okay. Um, so the kind of like workhorse behind most uh, convolution is uh, the conv two D function. Um, this is used for image processing, but you can also use it to do text processing if you like. Um, so the way um, it's implemented is basically you have a 3D tensor. Um, and, uh, and then you um, do a convolution between the, uh, between the input and the filter. And the filter is <laughs> basically a, a feature extractor. Um, I wrote here rows, e.g. words, but the, the words could also be columns if you like, uh, either, either is fine. Um, and so then you basically have this tensor where, um, it looks like, uh, it looks something like this. Um, or it could also alternatively look something like this. Where the, um, where the first dimension represents words, the second dimension is one, and then the third dimension is uh, the features uh, of uh, each word. And they could be you know, looked up as a word embedding or something like that. Um, and then uh, your, your filters, filters basically take in uh, rows and columns and uh, then do input features and uh, output features. So if you have 128 input features and 256 output features, then the input would be 120, uh, the third one would be 128, the fourth one would be 256. And then let's say we're doing it like this, the number of rows would be your n-gram size. So if you're, if you're using bigrams or trigrams, uh, the, the height would be two or three, basically. Um, another couple of important concepts are padding and uh, striding. So padding, basically the idea is that after, uh, after convolution, the rows and columns of the output tensor will either decrease, increase, or stay the same. Um, so there are three varieties of padding, um, or three varieties of convolution. Um, in one case, the rows and columns will stay the same. This is called a same, a same convolution um, in image land. Uh, in 
text land, I'm, I'm not sure if we have a special name for this. Um, the other alternative is that the rows and columns of the input, uh, the output will be equal to the rows uh, um, or columns of the input tensor minus the size of the filter plus one. So basically the idea here is this is very similar to what I showed in the previous uh, time delay neural network. This is uh, basically a narrow convolution. So what I mean by narrow is that the output gets narrower than the input. Um, so here, because the n-gram size is two and the input size is four, the output size will be three. Then the, um, then the opposite is a wide convolution where basically uh, you get wider uh, as you do this. And any of these, basically you achieve the first one by not doing any padding whatsoever. Um, and this will reduce uh, this will reduce the size because um, will reduce the size. The other one you get by basically padding either side of the um, padding either side uh, with n minus one elements, and um, the the first one you can get by doing appropriate padding. So you get exactly the same number. Um, uh, I guess you would pad with n minus one elements on one side uh, to get exactly the same number. Um, which one you want to use uh, really depends. Um, if you are doing tagging, for example, you will want to, you'll probably want to get the same uh, number of uh, outputs as you get input, so you can predict a tag for each word. So I think the first one is the common one. Uh, but you can come up with other ones as well. Uh, you can use whichever one uh, seems appropriate, I guess. Um, and then striding, uh, you can skip rows or columns. Uh, so a stride of uh, a two, for example, means every other one, uh, use every other one. Are there any questions about uh, kind of the mechanics here? Yeah. So I don't understand the columns of each part. So each word, would it still go through an effort layer? Yeah, um, so basically, um, conceptually, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Uh, if you want to always consider, so the one one thing I should mention here is you could also kind of think of a, a two-dimensional tensor like this, where this is features, or sorry, this is features, and this is words. But when you're doing um, when you're doing con uh, 2D convolution, in general, the semantics of the third dimension is the features. So if you start out with something like this, you need to do tricky things the first time you do a convolution, and then all succeeding, all succeeding convolutions will be like of a different shape. Um, so because we're using this conf uh, 2D function, which uh, comes from image land, basically we would like uh, the third dimension to be our uh, our feature dimension. So what you're embedding would it look like is actually a one by one, one by one by feature size thing. And you can look up a one by one by feature size uh, vector, and then you can look up multiple ones like this, and then concatenate them together either as rows or columns. So that's what we're actually doing in the example code. If you take a look at it. Um, well, it, that only depends on whether the position is important uh, for your sequence labeling problem. Um, you could think of cases in which they do, and kind of the good thing about the Culbert and Weston paper is they have not only the words, but they also have features of the words, and you could just add a positional embedding as an additional feature. So um, I, I think it's a good, I, good idea. I haven't done it myself, but now that you mention it, I, you probably should just add it every time because it sound, sounds good. Yeah. What is the lookup table here? Oh, the lookup table is... The, the lookup table is the thing that looks up your embedding for either the, the words or the features. Um, so, if you... Where is the conversion layer that features? Uh, so, this, this is the... 
to look at this picture first, the, this, this, the lookup table is the thing getting the red ones. The convolution layer is the thing get, getting the purple ones. In this paper, um, or, or in this example, the thing getting the red ones would be the lookup table. And then the thing turning them into the purple ones is basically um, the concat linear hard tan H is basically kind of a convolutional filter. And the thing is, you do this for every word in the sentence. Um, and because you do this for every word in the sentence, you gradually move one by one through the sentence, and that that looks like a convolution if you uh, if you think about it. And, and then there is only one connected layer. Um, in, in this paper, yes. Yeah. So what is the output dimension? The output dimension you can choose. Um, the output dimension of a convolution is specified by the number of output features, and that's a parameter of the model. So you can you can pick any number of output features you want. Usually it'll be something like two, 128 or 256, uh, just however many features you think you should do, and it's a hyperparameter. Um, yeah. Oh, um, so you, yeah, you also need a batch size dimension. That would be like your fourth dimension, I guess. In, in Dynet, it's your fourth dimension. In others where, or in Dynet, it's a special dimension. In other ones, um, if you're going by kind of like NumPy semantics, it would be your first dimension, and then you'd have to shift everything. Um, yeah. So yeah, they're learned. Uh, they, well, they could be pre-trained if you wanted to. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll move on. Um, the, these are all good questions. I'm happy to take uh, questions. Um, so next is pooling. So pooling is basically if you want to do convolutional feature extractors for each engram in the sentence, then combine them together uh, to get some sort of uh, thing that you'll use to make predictions. And this was kind of explained in the, in the reading materials, but I, I thought I would just kind of simplify this and put it on here uh, is one thing. So max pooling is by far the most common method for pooling. And I think the reason why is it actually makes a lot of sense um, in terms of a way to combine together features. So basically what this is saying is, did you see this feature anywhere in the range, anywhere in the sentence? So you look through all of the... Um, you look through all of the n-grams in the sentence and try to find any n-gram that matches that feature. Um, so that seems like a good idea, right? You find uh, really hate, and that's a really strong uh, that's a really strong indicator. So if you have that anywhere in the sentence, uh, you should make sure that you're using that in your classification. <clears throat> um, average pooling, on the other hand, is how prevalent is the feature over the entire sentence. So this might be good if you're doing something like topic modeling uh, or you wanted to predict the topic of a sentence. So there, if you only see an engram once, it might be less. Uh, it might be less informative than if you see it multiple times. So there, if you do averaging, that might be, uh, that might be a better choice. Um, another one is k-max pooling. This was used in a, a convolutional model by Kalkbrenner et al. Um, this is, uh, or no, or used in a convolutional model for sentences. I, I think it was that one. Um, and this is, did you see the feature up to k times? So this is like, you can count how many times you saw it. You can count how strongly you saw it. Um, this is not used a whole lot, but it's a, um, uh, it, it has been used previously. And then dynamic pooling. This is something that uh, is, has been used uh, a bit in a variety. And this is basically like, did you see the feature in the beginning 10% of the sentence? Did you see it in the second 10% of the sentence? Third 10% of the sentence? And this is kind of a good idea if you want to do something like variably linked sentences. So you have a sentence of length 30, you want to kind of know things that appear in the beginning, middle, or end, et cetera. Um, <coughs> and this, this has been used for, uh, for a few applications, some of which I'll talk about later. So are, are there any questions uh, so far? Um, yeah. Why does uh, average pooling actually make sense? Make sense in, uh, 
Mm -hmm. Say like, you know, I kind of think of product good. Do you think that makes sense? But instead of using uh, taking the average of all the property, but uh, if we let the gradient flow for each user, like, uh -huh. but I mean, uh, what is the mathematic um, functionality makes max good and explainable? Ma max or average? Max. Well, KMAX might be better, um, but you know, Max kind of Max kind of makes sense in that it's finding. Did you see this in the sentence anywhere? And you know, finding something in the sentence anywhere is a is a powerful feature if you want to um, if you want to look something. For that one particular feature. But remember, there's 128 features that we're extracting. So you're looking for the max of the first feature, then the max of the second feature, then the max of the third feature. So you might find one engram in one part of the sentence for the first feature, and then another engram in another part of the sentence for the second feature. So it actually does, it, it does make a lot of sense in that way. Um, and why average pooling? A really simple is, example is you know, from speech. Uh, let's say we wanted to tell whether it was a man or a woman. You can just average the the spec uh, the spectrogram, spectrogram, and basically, men on average have a lower voice than women do. Um, so taking the average makes sense sometimes, and you probably wouldn't want to take the max because even men might have peaks that are higher than women in some sentences. Yeah. But then you won't be able to capture the variation right? which would also be informative. Sure, and you might want variational pooling. I, <laughs> not variational, but variation pooling. I've never heard of anything like that, but you know. Yes, if, so yeah. a thing called product pooling by is actually dot product in every feature. Do you think that will be promising? Or? Um, if you can come up with an application for that, then sure. Uh, it sound, sounds like you could try it. Yes. Yeah. That's the same, just you're doing a summation in the log space. Is it the same in variable? It's not the same if it's variable it's length. Element wise, uh, uh, multiplication. If you just take a log of that, it's been summing over the log. So of the the Try that. Okay. Well, this is. <laughs> we can talk about this uh, offline. Maybe uh, it's an interesting idea. You can try it out. Um, so. So let me um, let me try to take a look at the code for what this looks like. It's uh, it's not too uh, difficult. So I will I will pull this down, and you can follow along. So we have two uh, we have two code examples. One is uh, CNN classification, and then one we're going to talk about visualizing the CNN uh, results. So here. Um, Basically, the, the top part of the code is all boilerplate code that you saw in the first uh, day of the class. So the only really interesting part here is um, the place where we calculate the scores of each sentence. And um, here it is. So um, as we do in Dynet, we, uh, we read in the parameters. These, uh, these parameters are the parameters for the CNN and the softmax. To take a look at the size, um, we have an embedding size. This is the size of the word embeddings, basically. This is the size of the window that we'll be using, so we're using trigrams. This is the size of the uh, filter size, or it's the feature size, I guess. Um, so this is the number of features in the output. Um, and for our uh, for our word embeddings, we have embeddings equal to embedding size, but instead we're using the third dimension instead of the first dimension. And that's precisely because um, we're using this conf2d function that assumes that the features are the third dimension. Um, then <clears throat> for our filter, we have something that is window size by embedding size uh, by filter size. So this is the input number of features, the output number of features, and the engram size. And then we have a bias, uh, a bias for this as well. Then we uh, we go down to the um, the place where we calculate the scores. 
So one thing you need to be a little bit careful of, this is kind of an edge case, uh, a thing catching an edge case where our filter is larger than our sentence. If your filter is larger than your sentence, it crashes um, if, you're, uh, um, if you're doing this. So uh, then we, um, we concatenate all of the, we look up all of the um, vectors and we concatenate them together along the first dimension. We uh, run this conv2d function with the bias. Um, and th this will calculate the convolution. Um, we take the max, so we're doing max pooling along the first dimension. Um, then because uh, as a result of this, we'll have a dimension, uh, uh, we'll basically have features where the third dimension is the feature dimension. Um, in order to do a matrix multiply, we need to have one where it's the first dimension, so we do, uh, we do a, uh, we reshape. Um, then we run some sort of, uh, of nonlinearity. Here we're using uh, a rectifier, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then we do, an, uh, we do an affine transform and calculate our scores. So if you want to do, if you want to create a convolutional uh, sentence classifier, this is, uh, this is a simple way to do it here. Yeah. Max is not a differentiable operation. It's a sub-differentiable operation. Um, so th this is an important point, actually. So max is not differentiable. You might want to, if you do, um, uh, and it will vary depending on which, which is the max, but it's still uh, quite common to use uh, in, in CNNs. Um, the thing that you really need to be careful of is something like the argmax. Um, so Max, you can still backpropagate through because it's sub-differentiable. Um, argmax is, is not a differentiable operation at all. So you can't do something like pick, choose something, and then uh, try to backprop through it. And you need to do something more complicated, like, uh, uh, like marginalizing over your choices or um, doing reinforcement learning. And I'm going to talk about that later, but max, uh, max is OK. Um, okay, so let me let me clarify this a little bit. Um, it's it's the difference between constant almost everywhere and being not constant almost everywhere. So max is not constant almost everywhere. So. But that that's a good point. I, I will clarify that. Um, any other any questions about the code itself? No. Okay. Um, so I will, uh, I will move back to the PDF or to the, the presentation materials. So, um, we will view this full screen. Um, so this is the very basics of convolution. Um, now we'll talk about some, uh, kind of advanced uh, things of convolution. So the first one is stacked convolution. And the idea of this is basically that we want to, um, we want to extract features once, and then we want to combine them uh, together one more time. And the idea behind this is in the first one, we can extract bigrams. And then based on the things we extracted from the bigrams, we can extract trigrams or something like this. And in general, you know, just making things deeper makes it possible to extract more complicated features. Uh, so the same is for convolution, and you can also extract wider spans uh, as well. Um, a particularly kind of interesting, uh, a particularly kind of interesting example of this is dilated convolution. So. The idea behind a dilated, con dilated convolution is basically um, at the very first step, we might have a, a bigram uh, that is convolving uh, things together um, and uh, convolving two characters together. Then in the second step, we, um, we might have a, another thing that's combining two bigrams together, so we get four grams. Then in the next one, we have a, a thing that's combining two 
four grams together to get eight grams, and then in the next one, we combine two eight grams together to get 16 grams. Um, this, I, I realized after I created this and after creating the code samples that this, uh, this graph is a little bit, um, it's a little bit maybe deceiving or confusing. So one important thing about dilated convolutions is we actually do them at every time step. So uh, we, we don't do it just at the end of the sentence. We do a similar process for the previous one and the previous one and the previous one and the previous one and the previous one. Um, so one example of a thing that you can do with these is you could do something like extracting sentence classes where basically um, instead of using bigrams, we use 16 grams to classify the sentence. Another thing you can do is do something like predict the next character in a language model. Um, and there's a, there's a nice paper that does this uh, that calculates the next character. Um, and the advantage of doing this in this way is that despite the fact that you don't have an exponential number or you don't have a, you don't have 16 um, or a, a width 16 filter, you can still uh, express these exponentially longer histories uh, using, uh, using something like this. And this has proven uh, quite effective for language modeling. You could also do something like word classes for tagging. Um, so kind of the idea is by having this, uh, this structure, it makes it more efficient to create, uh, calculate very long contexts. Um, so are, are there any questions here? Yeah. What is the difference between recursive So I think you can view this as a type of recursive neural network. In fact, it is a recursive neural network. Um, the only difference is that recursive neural networks um, are basically d described over tree structures, and those tree structures don't have to be binary trees like this. Um, the, the dilated convolution is basically a binary tree, and because of that, you can calculate it more efficiently than you can do other things. Yeah? How is this different from a simple hierarchy of convolutional layers? Um, it, it is basically a hierarchy of convolutional layers. The, um, the main difference and the reason why this is, uh, slide is a little bit confusing is because um, if you were just doing a stride two convolutional layer followed by a stride two convolutional layer, you would only get this for a, a particular, you'd only get this for the last character here basically. But the dilated convolution, what it's actually doing is it's calculating it for the first character, then the second character, then the third character, then the third character. Then the third character. So it's a little bit different. Um, in that you get a representation for each character in the sequence instead of only every 16 characters, basically. Is that clear? The differences between the word level representation and the character level representation? No. Uh, the, the reason why I did character level, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I understand that might, be, uh, might have been a little bit difficult to uh, understand here, but the reason why I did character level here is just because um, if I wrote... 16 words down here, it would be very difficult to read. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can run dilated convolutions over any input you like. It could be characters, it could be um, words, it could also be uh, frames in audio. Uh, and it's been very useful for frames in audio because frames in audio are very small units and you'd like to combine a bunch of small units into a bigger representation. But anyway, um, the, the main difference is that a stride, a strided convolution, it's like combining strided convolutions, but the main difference is a strided convolution reduces the number of vectors, while a dilated convolution keeps the same number of vectors on the output. Um, yeah, uh, maybe that's the best, uh, the best explanation. Yeah? So is the number of layers fixed them or not? No, you can define this any way you want. You could even, yeah. The sequence is longer, so yeah. that would be another layer or something? Oh, oh, the number of layers. Usually you use the same number of layers for every sequence, yeah. Um, and in order to make sure that you can do it, you add padding of some sort. Um, okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, how can we see that increasing slide here? I mean, oh, um, so at the bottom, you see there is um, one, two. Uh, you, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, sixteen. Uh, and in the second one, you have uh, you have only eight, and that's because you have a stride of two. And if you have a stride of two, you'll have two times fewer uh, vectors in the second one. Um, and this is just yeah. I, I'm sorry. I wish I had a better 
figure on the slides now, but you can look up uh, the dilated convolution paper uh, that's cited in the uh, cited it on the page, and uh, it might be significantly more clear after you take a look at the figure there. Yeah. Parameters at each level would be different, right? The parameters. Uh, yes, in general, um, they you, they wouldn't necessarily have to be, but I think it's a better idea to do that usually. Yeah. Oh, um. It, the question was, are the parameters different at every level? Um, OK. So let me move on to the next one. This is kind of an aside, but it's actually pretty important. Um, so we have a number of different nonlinear functions that we can use. Um, you could think of the step function that's basically 0 if uh, your input is less than 0 and 1 otherwise. We can't use this for the exact same reason we can't use argmax, because it's constant almost everywhere. So we can't get any gradient information from it. Um, the tan h is the one we've been using a lot, um, uh, which is a pretty good one. It's uh, stable to train, etc. Another one that people often use is this rectifier, uh, rectified linear unit. Um, particularly for convolutional networks, I've found this to be effective. Um, for other types of networks, tan h seems to work pretty well, but for some reason, uh, convolution, especially combined with max pooling, I've, I've found this to. Uh, work well. Um, there's also other things like soft plus, hard tan h, whatever uh, that people use uh, for a lot of things. You can probably find a good blog post that compares all of these. But yeah, go ahead. How about the performance of our value mm -hmm. compared to the EAU? Oh, um, that's a good one. I I actually haven't tried it myself, but I think the exponentiated linear unit has a lot of kind of like theoretically, it seems like a good idea uh, based on where you put, uh, based on what the gradients will uh, be. Um, I might talk about that a little bit later, but I'd have to read the paper one more time before I say anything uh, <laughs> to try to not embarrass myself too much. But um, you can take a look uh, as well. Um, OK, so um, why do convolutions work for modeling uh, sentences? So this is mainly in contrast to recurrent neural networks, which we'll talk about in detail in the next class. But basically, um, convolutions, there's uh, fewer rep steps from each word to the final representation. So if you think about a recurrent neural network, basically it's calculating this recursive function um, where you calculate from the beginning to the end of the sentence. Um, for a dilated CNN, for example, you would only have log n, and you could still cover everything in the sentence. Um, you might have even less if you have fewer layers. Um, they're easier to parallelize on GPU because you don't use the input of your previous calculation. Um, they're slightly less natural for handling arbitrary length uh, dependencies, and they're also usually a bit slower on the CPU than other things. So this is just a, a contrast that you can, uh, you can think of if you want to decide which one to use. OK, so I had a question about dependency trees before. Um, and I would like to talk uh, about some advances to convolution that basically allow you to incorporate kind of interesting structure. Um, a lot of these are kind of, uh, kind of recent. Um, but basically, language has structure. Uh, we'd like to use it to localize or calculate features uh, naturally. So noun-verb pairs can be very informative. Uh, but not captured by normal CNNs because they're far apart in the sentence. So this is exactly the reason uh, that uh, we had the question about earlier. Um, so an example, dependency structure, which we was also in the question, we might have something like this. Um, uh, so in the dependency structure, we have links between each of our words, and each of those links has a, uh, has a label. Um, so there's a, <clears throat> a couple different uh, ways we can incorporate this. Um, one is tree structured convolution, which basically means um, instead of calculating our convolutions based on, um, instead of calculating our convolutional features based on things that are next to each other, we calculate convolutional features based on things that are next to each other in the dependency tree. So we extract. Um, we extract all of these uh, feature templates where M is the word itself, uh, H is maybe its parent, and G is its grandparent. Um, we also extract M, 
and also its sibling, so anything that's next to it in the dependency tree, et cetera. So this is one example. Uh, you can look at more details on the, um, oh, grand, G, G squared is great grandparent, apparently. Um, and you can find more, uh, you can find the paper on the website. Uh, one that has been applied to NLP very recently, in fact, I just got back from NL, uh, EMNLP where there were two presentations on this. Um, but this is, uh, this is a kind of interesting idea. It's called graph convolution. And the idea is that any graph you can come up with, basically you can create a convolution where you follow the graph edges and do some sort of uh, combination of the inputs based on parameters, uh, based on those graph edges. And if you look at, um, if you look very closely here, sorry, this figure is kind of small, um, but you can look at the paper as well. Each of the parameters is, which parameter you use to calculate this convolution is based on which edge goes between these two words. So you have parameters for n mod, you have parameters for object, you have parameters for subject. So what you're saying is if this word has a neighbor, or sorry, <laughs> if this word has an object and that object is a, a dog or something like that, you change the, uh, the representation of this word by a little bit. Um, and importantly, each word also has a convolution from itself to itself that's labeled the self convolution. So you could think of kind of interesting things where it's like, I will keep my own, I will keep my own representation unless there's a knot somewhere uh, connected to me in the dependency tree. And if there's a knot, uh, connected to me in the dependency tree, instead I'll change my representation. So you can think of all kinds of uh, interesting things that could be uh, expressed by this, uh, by this here. Um, I am totally, I'm sorry, I did the first part too slowly because I didn't have very many slides today and I realize uh, um, we're kind of running out of time at the end, so I'll try to go through, uh, try to go through. Um, you can also think of models of sentence pairs. Um, and I'm going to talk about this uh, a little bit in two, more in two classes. But you can think of a lot of things where you want to talk about the relationship between uh, sentence pairs. So you can think of things like paraphrase identification. You can think of things like textual entailment. So does this sentence entail another sentence? Um, if this sentence is true, is another sentence true? Um, you can think of also about retrieval, where you want to get, you want to input something like a query and retrieve a document or something like that. Um, so all of these things are where you want to, um, where you want to compare pairs of text. And kind of the <clears throat> standard way of doing this is called a Siamese network. Um, so the idea of a Siamese network is um, is where you basically have identical networks on both sides. You run everything through the network. Maybe a, it's a convolutional network with max pooling and you calculate a vector. Um, and then you compare these vectors according to some distance measure. Um, and if they're close, then they're probably pairs. If they're not close, then they're probably not pairs. And I think the first example of this was in 1993, uh, which was time delay networks for signature recognition, where you put in two si signatures and, um, and basically tried to calculate if they were the same. So this will work if you want to do like paraphrasing or something like that. Uh, paraphrase recognition, I'm sorry. Um, there have been more interesting applications of this. Um, or more or better ways to do this basically um, using convolutional networks. It's a kind of clever, uh, clever idea where <clears throat> basically you treat the sentence as an image um, where each sentence is 1D essentially, but you, can you compile them into a 2D image where the first part of your feature vector uh, corresponds to the word in one sentence. And then the second part of your feature vector, like this, uh, corresponds to the word in another uh, in the other sentence. And then you can create this matrix. And then by doing convolution over this matrix, you can basically extract uh, which parts of the sentence match uh, match up well. And if you know particular engrams in the sentence match well with each other, uh, then you get high feature scores or, or whatever. 
Um, and this was shown to be more effective than the simple Siamese network. It's not so surprising um, because you're explicitly calculating uh, matches between them. Um, then there are more uh, elaborate methods like where you do something like a, uh, a stacked convolution where the first one is just unigrams, the second one is bigrams or trigrams, the third one, uh, then the third one when you get all the way up to the third one, you have a sentence representation. And then you do pooling between these among them. So if you want to go crazy, you can go crazy with these. And I think this one was shown better to work better than the other one uh, before. So lots, lots of ways you could do this. And if you want to spend progressively more space in your paper on drawing elaborate diagrams of how you do convolution, then this is the method for you. I think this was one whole page. OK. So the final thing, I think this is really, really interesting. Um, people, what, often we want to understand uh, why, uh, why a CNN or why a neural network in general uh, made a choice about something. And um, why would we want to do this? So sometimes we want to know why a model is making predictions. Uh, is there a bias of some sort in the model? So. Uh, I talked about this a little bit earlier. Sometimes we might want to debias uh, things so we aren't making predictions based on gender stereotypes or something like this. Uh, if we can look at our model and understand why it made its decisions, we might be able to uh, n notice that this is happening more easily. Um, also, if we can understand the extracted features, this might lead to new uh, ideas about how we could model our architecture appropriately, so it might give us better uh, results. Um, unfortunately, uh, the people in vision are way ahead of us on this. They do a much better job at visualizing things uh, and methods for text are a little bit less sophisticated. But recently there's been a lot of advances in this um, about how to visualize uh, things as well. So I'll talk about uh, the different kinds very briefly. So um, I have a link to a blog post. It's on vision things because uh, as I said, vision is a little bit more, uh, the, the methods have been used more uh, uh, extensively. But <clears throat> one way we can do this is we can look at each feature, and then for each feature, we can basically extract the images that result, or the image segments that result in this feature having the highest value. So um, this is an example of doing this. They took the first feature and extracted the uh, the segments that resulted in being this being big biggest, and we could see that uh, this tended to correspond to people. Uh, the second one tended to correspond to dogs. Uh, the third one <coughs> corresponds to either flowers or red bowls of pasta or something like that. Uh, <laughs> you, you can't, I can't really tell, but um, you, you know, by visualizing things this way, you can uh, you can take a look at things. Um, another way that people have done it, this time it's an example from text, what you do is you take the extracted features, you don't just take them for words, you take them for the whole sentence, and, um, and then you cluster the sentences together. And then you can see you know, what the model thinks, of, uh, thinks are similar sentences, or maybe what the model thinks are similar uh, engrams or something like this. Um, so this can be uh, used uh, as well. And then the final one, this is a kind of clever idea. Basically what they do is they cover up a particular part uh, of an image and they cover up the part of the image and then they see how the prediction changed. So this is also something you could do for text. You could replace a particular word vector with a zero vector and then see how the prediction changed. And if the prediction changes a lot, you make it blue. If the prediction doesn't change very much, you make it red. So here, if you cover up the dog's face, you get a very different prediction. But if you cover up anything else, it doesn't make a big difference. Yeah. Uh, this has been done in text uh, by <laughs> MIT, the one in which they try to predict emojis from text. Okay. So the online interface has an option to remove yeah. I, I think I think a lot of people have done this for text. Uh, I, uh, if you could send that paper out later, that'd be, that'd be great, and I'll add it to the references. But I think a lot of these have been used for text, uh, but I. Uh, was a little bit lazy in <laughs> looking up all of them. Um, but all of these are pretty straightforward to apply to text. They're not, uh, I, I didn't use the ones that are less, uh, I didn't show the ones that are less straightforward here. Um, so we have a, another code example of this. Um, 
as I'm running out of time and I'd like to, you know, allow for some time for questions at the end, I won't show the actual code, but you can take a look at it if you're interested. Um, what I will show is kind of an example that we, we hacked up five minutes before the class, so there might be better examples if you, uh, if you play around with the code. But this is an example of, um, we have eight features, um, and for each of the eight features, we look at the, what, what is this? This is the engram that gave it the highest uh, value. Wow. What, how do we interpret the columns? It was the engram, it was the engram that gave the highest value of the feature, right? Yeah, when the, when the color screen is the highest. Okay. So, um, so each of these engrams are, uh, are things that gave a high value for that particular feature. And also how much that feature contributed to the prediction of very good, um, very good, bad, uh, medium, very bad, or something. Do we, do we have the value of uh, the feature for each of these engrams? Maybe not. OK. So an additional, an additional piece of information that might be interesting is how much uh, each of those engrams contributed to each feature. But, but anyway, uh, what you can see from here is you can see honest and um, honest and keenly, uh, which is cut off a little bit in the figure, uh, gives a very high value for very good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so honest and keenly seems to be a good engram, basically, and it's giving a high v value for very good here. Um, uh, doesn't doesn't feel is getting uh, is giving very bad or bad. It's contributing to very bad or bad. So you can kind of see that each of these engrams in this particular sentence, which one is contributing to the idea of good, uh, which is the contributing to the idea of uh, medium or something. Um, I, I challenge everybody in the class to take this code and come up with a better visualization because <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is a, a reasonable visualization, but I think uh, you, could do, uh, you could do better if you take out the code and, and hack it together. Um, as I said, uh, I, I, w I think this is great. It's much better than nothing, uh, but um, you know, kind of visualizing these in a nice way could uh, lead you to good insights for your project or whatever. So I think it's uh, nice to try. Okay, um, that's it for the slides. Are there any uh, are there any questions or final questions or something? Uh, yeah. What? What's that? Um. <clears throat> so, in the case of images, uh, I think the consensus is yes. Um, the deeper you make it, the better your results tend to be. For NLP, usually you stop, uh, like the deepest you go is eight. Eight is still pretty deep. Um, <coughs> I, I have heard from people who have very big data that they have tried 16, and 16 helps a little bit, but not a huge amount. Um, one interesting thing that I, uh, this is not entirely my uh, idea, is um, but from discussion that I had uh, with some other people, um, is basically images we're starting from very low level features. So because we're starting from very low level features, we need to learn lots of combinations. Um, from for text, we're actually starting from relatively high level features. The word cat means a lot more than you know the individual pixels in an image of a cat. So probably we don't need networks that are quite as steep. But that's also what people said five years ago when they said deep learning is not necessary for NLP. So <laughs> you might be, want to take uh, that opinion with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, one important thing that actually I didn't mention here is if you're going to make things deeper, you definitely need to use things like residual connections or something. Um, Otherwise, if you just make your net deep uh, without being careful about it, uh, it will make your results worse. So um, being careful but making things deeper tends to help, and it tends to not make things uh, worse, I guess. Um, any other, anything else? It's violated um, like low band complexity, you think? That's when you're assuming parallel layers of computation, what's going on? Dilated being more efficient? Meaning like low-band operations, like uh, when 
it is assuming that the parallel is there. I don't know what you mean. You're saying for. So you're saying when we assume. Yeah. It's being parallelized. Yeah. Um, that's not necessarily the case because if you if you think about it, if you wanted to extract sixteen five layers of sixteen gram features, at the very top layer you would have to uh, use a sixteen like. 16 times as wide matrix multiply, while in the dilated at the very top, you only have to use a, a two, basically a, a size two matrix so multiply. In terms of like matrix multiplication complexity, is that, okay. It is, it is lower for dilated. Um, so you're not just gaining from parallelization, you're also gaining from the fact that uh, yeah, yeah. it's less. Okay, um, it, it looks like it's uh, time to finish up. So thank you everybody. I'm happy to take any other additional questions.